Good evening. My name is Mary Sawyer, and I'm the faculty chair of this year's Institute on National Affairs. And it is my pleasure to welcome all of you here this evening. We feel that the topic of this year's Institute is especially meaningful during this time of change in our country, and we look forward to a lively discussion throughout the week. Before we introduce our speakers, I would like to take a moment to thank all of the students who worked so hard to make this event possible. Would the students on the Institute's committee please stand? <laughs> this Institute, which is an annual event, is very much a collective effort. It could not occur without the involvement of dedicated and creative students and staff. And certainly no one is more dedicated and creative than the staff of the Lectures Committee, Pat Miller. So let us also acknowledge Pat's contribution. <laughs> All of us on the committee would like to invite anyone who might be interested in helping with next year's institute to join us in the Pine Room of the Memorial Union at 4 o'clock on Thursday, February 18, or stop by the Lectures Program Office in 36 Physics for more information. Now to introduce our speaker, one of our student chairs, Jennifer Smizer. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everybody of the upcoming activities and tomorrow evening, this evening's speakers will be speaking again on the subject of uh, living democracy. And then tomorrow evening we will have Lawrence Jones in the sunroom at 8 p.m. and he will be speaking on the Ezekiel experience values from the other side. Um, our keynote address will be presented by Francis Moore LePay and Paul Dubois. Um, together they are the co-founders of the Institute for the Arts of Democracy. Ms. LePay is the author of several books, including Diet for a Small Planet and Rediscovering America's Values, which are both on sale over at the table. And uh, she has also co-founded the Institute for Food and De Developmental Policy. Mr. Dubois has been vice president at Cambridge College and at the College of the Atlantic. He also has authored books such as The Hospice Way of Death and Modern Practices in Human Service Agencies. Together, they have co-authored a new book, Doing Democracy, which will be out later this year. Uh, we will hope you will join us for the rest of this week's activities, and we would like to remind you that Tuesday's presentation does start at 7 p.m. and not 8 p.m. as stated in our pamphlets. Uh, please give a warm welcome to Francis Morlapay and Paul Dubois. Thank you, thank you. For the last few years, we've been traveling around the, around the country, really discovering what many of you already know, that this country has a great many very, very large problems. But we've also been finding some signs of hope, a rethinking of democracy, and that's what we're here to talk about tonight. We don't have to be blinded by all the bad news that the media gives us constantly. There are untold stories of democracy, democracy coming to life, that really shows, that really show a great many new possibilities. Ordinary people have been sharing their lessons of success, people who have learned to solve this country's problems and we're here tonight to share some of their lessons with you. And we're going to start with a dialogue that contrasts the usual remedies for democracy with the lessons that these people have been showing us. And I'm going to wear this tie during the dialogue <laughs> because I hope that someday, in fact, the Stars and Stripes will come to represent the kind of democracy, isn't this ridiculous? The kind it looks of better on me, just wait. All right. It does, that's true. The kind of democracy that, in fact, we're going to be talking about, this richer, living democracy. And when we're finished with this short dialogue, and I'm very glad it's short, don't take a picture now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. When we're finished, we're going to ask you to actually analyze what these two voices have been saying about what's wrong with America. Paul, there's so many things wrong. Where do I start? I pick, pick up the paper and I, I'm bombarded. I mean, whether we're talking about crime or the environment or drugs. But wait a, wait a minute. Are these the problems or are they only the symptoms of the problems? I mean, maybe beneath them lies a deeper kind of crisis. I mean, after all, lots of people care about these problems. Lots of people are trying to do something about them, but they're getting worse, right? Well, I believe there is a deeper crisis. It's the crisis of our political system. 
three quarters of Americans very recently said that our political system is broken. It's run by insiders who don't listen to working people and who cannot solve our problems. I think we need reform. We certainly need campaign finance reform. We need to reform voter registration. I think we might even need a new political party. No, you may be right part of the way. I mean, our political system certainly needs fixing, but there's a lot more than that. That's, that's not really what I'm trying to get at when I talk about the real crisis. I mean, suppose the real crisis lies beneath all of these issues, all of the things that we can talk about, even beneath the failure of our system of government and the failure that, uh, of, of the way in which we elect people. Suppose the real crisis is that most of us don't see a place for ourselves in actual decision making, in the solving of public problems. I mean, there's a huge sense of distance between ordinary people and the folks who make the decision. Don't you remember the guy on the Donahue show? Absolutely true story. This guy stands up, they're talking about the SNL crisis, right? This guy stands up and he says, I don't see why the taxpayers have to bail us out of this mess. Why can't the government do it? <laughs> I mean, a real sense of distance between us and the government. But that's why we need to reform the political system so that people won't be so turned off. But even reforming the political system is not truly going to fix what's wrong. I mean, people would still feel distant from decision making. They wouldn't feel that it's part of them, that they have a role in decision making. They wouldn't feel any responsibility themselves for actually jumping in and creatively finding solutions. And the answers would still come from top down. Well, you're saying that we need more. And I'm saying that we really can't expect anything more. I mean, people already are overwhelmed, for one thing. And for many, the, the political system is a joke. I remember last fall, that bumper sticker, it said, if God had meant us to vote, he would have given us candidates. <laughs> I mean, people, but maybe even worse is that people are overwhelmed by their uh, personal problems. How can they be expected to take on public problems? I mean, I think, Underneath it all, people probably just don't care enough. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. People do care. They are not apathetic. Study after study shows that people are not deep down apathetic. What they are, are angry. They feel powerless. They feel shut out. They don't feel capable anymore of solving problems. And what's worse, they feel absolutely powerless to do anything about that feeling of being shut out. No matter how important certain political reforms might be that you can talk about forever, the fact is that the real challenge of democracy goes beneath that. And it's that, it's this one question, how do Americans come to see that for democracy to really, really work, it's going to have to be a lot more than just about a political system. It's going to have to become a way of life, a way of life in which regular people play essential roles, not just on voting day, but every day of the year not just in the polls, but in their schools and in their workplaces, on this campus, in their communities, in neighborhoods, everywhere. Okay. Okay. Now, while Paul takes off his tie, let's go a little bit deeper into what his voice is communicating in, in this mock dialogue. To do that, we'll ask you to look at handout number one and take just one moment. We've made a list there for you. And let your eye just roam over our list. And as you do so, Ask yourself, what are the common themes that you're finding here? Are there any threads that unite these very short examples we've put on handout one? Okay. What does it mean that in Birmingham people actually elect their, their citizen council? I mean, what does it mean that welfare recipients in New York actually own their own homes? Anybody? What are the common themes that you see here? Anything come to mind right off the bat? Anyone? What do you think? Empowerment. Empowerment. What do you mean by that? Uh, these are citizens who are uh, taking things into their own hands to uh -huh. some degree. Can you all hear that? These are citizens who have taken things into their own hands to some degree. So he says one of the themes that he sees here is empowerment. Anybody else? What else do you see here? That's a great answer. What else? Anybody? Okay, they're not only being empowered, they're also being responsible, they're taking responsibility for what they're doing and for what's happening in their lives. Yeah. You see any other themes? 
Anyone else? What do these things have in common? They're all true. What else? We had somebody who said, well, they're all on the same typeface. <laughs> Can you see anything else? I think that these... Oh, there was somebody okay. here was just about to... Pardon me? People themselves making the policy? Yeah, go on. You're, you're, you're nodding. What, what do you mean? Either one of you. That's fine. People themselves making policies, making decisions. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Anybody else? Yeah. Ah, cooperation. Another word is collaboration sometimes. Cooperation among people. Great, yeah. Aha, uh -huh. conflict resolution among groups. Yeah. That has to happen also. Yeah, let's go down here. Acting locally. Okay, I think, I, I don't know whether we have some, some examples down here um, that are not just local, but because we do have stories in the book that. That, that are not simply local, but a lot of these are local. And that's how people do, in fact, do what these other folks have been saying, taking some authority, responsibility into their own hands. Yeah? Bottom up rather than top down. Bottom up. There's a phrase I like. Bottom up rather than top down. Okay. Great. Great. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I think that what you've hit on, exactly what we ourselves find, First, people taking direct responsibility, working collaboratively, and actually solving real problems. Now, what do these developments have to say about democracy? To us, they suggest that democracy, formal democracy with its multiple parties and its constitutional government, is not enough. That just as nails and a hammer don't constitute carpentry, that our formal institutions in and of themselves don't make democracy. They're simply tools. That democracy means people coming together to solve our common problems. Mm -hmm. That one realization really changed the course of both of our lives. And that's part of what we're here to talk with you about. The two of us have come to understand that, in fact, none of the particular concerns that we had focused our energies on, whether it's racism or world hunger or or the problems that many of you are concerned about, the environment and poverty and so on, that none of them are going to be addressed effectively, successfully, without addressing this deeper crisis of democracy at the same time. And that's a very radical statement, because what we're talking about is nothing less than the rethinking of the meaning of democracy. So let us take a few moments to tell you the path that we each took to come to this realization and why we think this is so terribly important. And Francis, why don't we start with you? I mean, people know you for 20 years of work on, on world hunger. Tell these folks what made you come to this focus on democracy. Well, I believe that if I could just help people understand that hunger is needless, that it's made by human-made institutions, and that we could just change those because they are human-made, that we could get at the roots of hunger, and so my first step was to write a one-page handout <laughs> that became Diet for a Small Planet. And then sort of I became the, the Julia Child of the soybean circuit. <laughs> that wasn't exactly what I had in mind, because what I wanted to do was to explain and to alarm people, to awaken people to the, the roots of hunger that, that could be addressed. And I got very, very good at shocking people with the horror of the extent of hunger in the world. But by the early 1980s, my message boiled down to one simple statement. And that is that hunger is not caused by a scarcity of land or a scarcity of food, but is caused by a scarcity of democracy. Wait, wait a minute, what does that mean, a scarcity of democracy? Well, it meant for me that I could visit many countries with all of the trappings of democracy, with beautiful constitutions and dozens of political parties in a few cases, and yet, the majority of people lived in misery. That these formalities of democracy did not mean that the majority weren't excluded from decision-making power over the most primal of needs, such as food itself. And so 
I wanted to expose those anti-democratic roots of hunger. Well, that's good enough as far as it goes, I suppose, but what does that really say about democracy? I mean, can you actually point to a model of democracy that is strong enough to end world hunger? Well, at first I had no answer to those questions. I felt very uncomfortable standing in front of audiences without any answers to those questions. And gradually, I began to see that looking for some ideal model or simply decrying the tragedy of needless hunger, as I had been doing, both could blind us. Both could blind us to opportunities that we have right now to begin to live democracy, to begin to take responsibility for decisions that affect us. And in fact, this whole talk is about what happens when people break with, when people break with that kind of despair. Okay, Paul. Oh, it's my turn. <laughs> it's your turn. All right. Being born black in a society that's predominantly run by whites must have focused your attention very early on the problem of racism. And here you are tonight saying that the root problem is democracy. Tell me, why? All right, well, it's true. I was focused on the problems of racism from a very, very early age. In fact, you'll be amazed at quite at just how early. Um, I was born in Harlem Hospital in 1945. And in those days, in the, in the middle of Harlem, in the leading hospital of that part, portion of Manhattan, they had two wards for babies, one called the Negro Ward and the other called the White Ward. And when I was born, the nurses took one look at my parents. They had no problem. They put me in the Negro Ward. But I was so light-skinned that four hours later, another shift of nurses came along. They hadn't seen my parents. They thought that a terrible mistake had been made. <laughs> They moved me to the white ward, and then they went upstairs to apologize to my parents. <laughs> now, <laughs> that was my introduction to the complex subject of race relations in this country. They had to go back downstairs and move me to the, quote, Negro ward. And my mother tells me that with that introduction to the complex subject of race relations, I was simply not very pleased. <laughs> now, I was four hours old. That's where it all began. So with that, I'm still asking, how did you end up coming to this place tonight to talk about democracy? All right, well, I did focus on problems of racism as I grew older. And as I, and as I got to be a teenager, I really burned with, with, with outrage at the problems of racism and poverty and oppression of, of, of my people. And, and in fact, that kind of outrage really drove almost every important decision that I made. I was arrested time after time on civil rights marches. And when we won the Great Society programs, um, I became the assistant director of a model cities program where people were asked to participate in real decision making. And you know what? It worked. It worked when two conditions were met. First of all, when people learned the skills of good decision making. And secondly, when they were really genuinely allowed to make good decisions. But those conditions didn't exist very often. And so I moved to something a little more radical. I became the executive director of the largest black community organization in the state of New York at that time. And we ran programs in which people did make decisions. We ran programs in which they did create their own housing. They did design their health programs. They did design their anti-drug programs. They designed their um, uh, education programs, their health programs, and so on. And to this day, there are black children in the city of Rochester whose future is a great deal better because their parents were empowered in programs like that. And when I turned to teaching undergraduates, that, that very rewarding career, as vice president of College of the Atlantic, that is to say, emotionally rewarding, not financially rewarding. <laughs> Um, I really learned that what worked best in education was the same thing that was working in the rest of the, of the experiences that I had already had, that, that same kind of empowerment when, when students had a chance to really participate in shaping their own educational program, their own educational experiences, and therefore they had a sense of ownership. And then at the graduate level as vice president of Cambridge College, I learned that what worked best also was when their academic studies were related to real world problem solving. And then I turned rather intently to, to the women's movement, the, the dynamic women's movement that, that was very, very um, viable at, at, at the time. 
to try to learn even more about public problem solving. And I became the president of a NOW chapter, and I became the um, head of Planned Parenthood of Nashville, and then the head of all of Planned Parenthood of, of, of Tennessee. And the lesson that I learned there was that self-interest could motivate people very, very admirably. And just as we had discovered in the civil rights movement that we had to redefine power, so we learned in the women's movement that we had to redefine self-interest. We'll talk more about that in a little while. And then I became the head of a large professional association. And, and I was looking for a synthesis of insights into human personality, really. And I learned that we all have an incredible hunger for meaning and an incredible capacity for growth. And the question then was, how could all of these lessons be somehow related to social change? So lots of questions really pushed me even further. And what I decided was sort of no more of these kind of piecemeal insights. What did all of this learning really add up to? I mean, after all, the world was indeed getting worse. But people were teaching very, very valuable lessons. And it was important to try to draw those lessons, pointing in the direction of a democracy that could, in fact, work to solve our problems. So you can see that we took quite different paths to arrive at one conclusion, and that is that the problems that are confronting us today simply cannot be solved from the top down. The, to be solved, three conditions have to be met, and we've, we've listed those on handout number two. What does it take? Very realistically, first, it, it takes the, the ingenuity it takes the experience of those directly affected, whether we're talking about patients or welfare recipients or students or teachers. It takes the creativity that emerges when diverse perspectives meet and mix. And third, maybe most important of all, solutions to the kind of complex problems that we face today require the commitment, the commitment to implementation that only comes when people know that they themselves have been part of devising the solution. And these are precisely the conditions in the way that are missing now in the way America practices democracy. I mean, the kind of democracy we have now is what this gentleman referred to earlier, this sort of top-down politics. But as, as I said earlier, as we've traveled around the country, what we found are many successful people who are learning to solve America's problems. And they are incorporating those lessons into their practice of public life. And so these are the lessons that are emerging from some of the stories that you read in that first handout and they're the lessons that we want to share with you. So what we want to say to you is that these kinds of lessons are really emerging across the country even though you won't find them in the media. They're emerging in schools and workplaces and human service agencies and even the media and we'd like to give you a taste of what we mean. Now, I'll start with economics. <laughs> And you might be quite surprised. I mean, how can we say anything good about what's happening to the economy of our country? In fact, the figures show that during the 1980s, 60% of all income gains accrued to the top 10% of our population. Most of us lost ground. And yet, despite such uh, very telling statistics as these, despite this, there are people in their communities people in citizen groups of all kinds, at unions and church groups coming together to make sure that they are not simply vulnerable to what a corporation in their vicinity has to say or what the impersonal market will do to them. In fact, let me give you an example. An example in Connecticut is called the Naugatuck Valley Project. And I'd like to introduce you to one person. Her name is Teresa Francis, and she's 63 years old. Now, Teresa public life, most of her life, her public life consisted of going to work at Century Brass and singing in the church choir. Wait a minute, I'm going to interrupt here. Public life. I used that phrase a minute ago. You just used it. For pu most people, public life is what? What celebrities and politicians have. So you better explain what that means. Okay, let me explain by asking you. How many of you work? <laughs> How many of you go to church or synagogue? How many of you belong to an organization like a PTA or a Rotary? or a professional organization. You are experiencing public life in each of these roles because in each of these roles are choices, influence the larger community, even to the national level, I'm convinced. And so Teresa's public life, to return, Teresa's public life greatly expanded in 1986. 
What happened is that Century Brass threatened to close. She was going to lose everything, including her retirement benefits. Naugatot Valley Project talked to Teresa and convinced her that she could fight it. She joined with others in her community, and over five years, they protected 500 jobs. Ultimately, they lost. But Teresa told us what mattered to us is that we didn't stop there. We, we kept together. We built the relationships within the Naugatuck Valley Project. And so when Uniroyal threatened to close, we knew what to do. We got hundreds of people together. We ended up meeting with the president of Uniroyal. And Teresa told us what felt great is that what happened to us didn't happen to the folks at Uniroyal. Now, Teresa is suffering from cancer, and yet she told us, it's such a joy at this stage in my life. It's such a joy. And we, what is the joy? She said, the joy is knowing that I don't have to just let things happen to me. I can make things happen. You see, she said, in the Nagatot Valley Project, they don't do things for us. They help us learn how we can do things for ourselves. Now, this project, in addition to saving several thousand jobs from plant closings, has helped three company workers in three companies buy their companies, and three more worker buyouts are on the way. They've confronted the biggest obstacle facing workers in buying out their companies when there's a threat in closing, and that is lack of capital, because they've negotiated a, straight, a state trust fund to fund worker buyouts. They've tackled the problem of rising cost of housing by creating a very ingenious citizen invented form called the Community Land Trust that creates permanently affordable housing and got the, the state to support it. So the Naugatuck Valley project that Teresa is part of is not fringe. It's not simply about protesting failed policies. It's about creating. It's about creating a permanent place for citizens in negotiating their own economic futures. And such independent citizen organizations are now in virtually every state. The largest has 2 million members now in 37 cities. So that's just a taste of what can happen in a viable democracy in the whole field of economics. Let's turn to education now for just a minute. We all know about the schools across this country, and we all know that the top heavy bureaucracy is under attack everywhere. I mean, in part because the simple fact is it doesn't work. But under what some people call school-based management, parents and teachers and sometimes students are learning to run their own schools in Chicago of all places, a very unlikely coalition of thousands and thousands of low-income parents along with corporate leaders managed to get past one of the most sweeping school decentralizations just three years ago in the history of American education and now local school councils where parents are in the majority make nearly all of the important decisions about every one of those schools. And Chicago is not alone. In dozens and dozens of school districts across the country, there, there is this rising of, of, of school-based management kinds of approaches. And within classrooms, change is underway as well. We have visited successful public schools even in the inner city, even among the most deprived kids where students themselves are helping to define their courses, and then they succeed better over time, they have higher graduation rates and so on because they feel a sense of ownership of the educational experience. Kate is a, is a student in, in one upstate New York school and, um, whom we visited with, and, and she put it this way. She said, everyone here thinks of this as our school because we're the ones who make something happen here. And then she said, I think our school encourages people to participate more, democra more in democracy in our country when they're older because they're used to it here. And Kate's point is exactly our point. And successful schools are linking classroom learning with real world problem solving. At the University of, of Pennsylvania, faculty and students have learned to come together with community leaders to create, uh, to first of all improve nine local schools, and secondly to create a, a, an employment and job training center. And this sort of cooperation between communities and colleges is also happening across the country. And in Amesville, Ohio, one of our favorite stories involves a toxic spill in the town creek. And the local sixth grade, beginning to study sixth grade chemistry, decided that they wouldn't trust the EPA to clean it up. These kids constituted themselves as the sixth grade Amesville water chemists. They tested the water. 
They worked with the town to get the cleanup accomplished. They became the town's water quality control team. And along the way, they learned science and public policy and law and psychology and overall how to become effective in this society. They also told us they learned teamwork, uh, excuse me, they learned strategic thinking. They said that they learned that you had to put one smart kid in each team. <laughs> <laughs> but let me return sort of to the theme of economics, taking it another step into the workplace. What we're discovering is there too that top-down decision making is giving way. It's giving way because it doesn't work as well as what people are discovering in the form of teamwork and worker ownership. In fact, almost one half of today's Fortune, of today's Fortune 1000 companies are experimenting with teamwork. In companies as different as Chaparral Steel in Midlothian, Texas and the Saturn GM plant in Spring Hill, Tennessee, teamwork is what is making the company profitable. Workers there told us that we have considerably more decision-making power in this team structure. But more than this decision-making, we also feel greater dignity. There are no time clocks here, we were told by a worker at Saturn. They treat us like adults. Now, one particularly interesting story, a telling story for us, is the story of workplace ownership. And that is that, in fact, Today, um, in four major industries, businesses in which workers own the majority now rank in the top 10, and their performance is outdoing companies without worker ownership. Now, steel is one of these industries in which worker owners are in the top 10. Let me just tell you a story of what this can mean. <laughs> in the early 1980s, National Steel owned Weirton, Weirton in Weirton, Pennsylvania. And they didn't think Weirton Steel was profitable enough for them. And so they stopped investing in Weirton. And the workers noticed. They noticed that the, the plant was deteriorating. And they knew their jobs were at stake. But instead of being paralyzed by their fear, they joined together and bought Weirton. And what happened? They made it so profitable that by the late 80s, Weirton was the only US steel company that, had, that showed a profit every quarter. The profits they earned, they returned in part in, in profit sharing. And then what did they do? In the early 1990s, they said, we'll do what National refused to do. And they put hundreds of millions of dollars into modernization. But they said, we are investing this time in ourselves. So in the community, and in schools, and in workplaces, and companies everywhere, there really are signs of change that you're not going to find in the media. But there is one sector of this society, namely the media, where most of us don't hold a whole lot of hope. I mean, studies show time and time again that Americans, in fact, feel rather helpless when it comes to the media and the sorts of, of messages that come into our living rooms and our children's minds. After all, just 23 corporations now control most media outlets in this country. And newspaper readership continues to decline. And in fact, the experts tell us that Americans can only handle sound bites, and the sound bites keep shrinking smaller and smaller. Last election, honest to goodness, when CBS News tried to counter that trend, they declared a policy, the campaign statements had to be more than 30 seconds. And I'm, I swear to you this is true, the executive producer of CBS News actually said, frankly, we're skeptical whether we can keep this up. It's very hard to find candidates saying anything substantive for 30 seconds. <laughs> now, but when the Philadelphia Inquirer ran a long, fact-filled, just wonderful analysis of the economy of all things, of all things the economy, and what's behind the fact that the rich are getting richer and the rest of us are certainly not, and why so many of us are suffering, circulation rose 10,000 copies, and so the paper issued a reprint. And in fact, the pe so many people mobbed the doors, they had to hire extra security in order to handle the demand. 500,000 extra copies later, and 20,000 calls and letters later, these people have proven a point. That in fact, Americans do want to know what affects their lives. And that series of articles eventually became a wonderful book 
America, What Went Wrong, and Donald Bartlett, one of the two authors, will be here in this series um, a little bit later on. Um, and what the whole ex experience demonstrates is that ordinary Americans, in fact, want to know what's happening in their lives. In Wichita, Kansas, finally the Wichita Eagle got that message enough to decide that in decent weather they're going to pitch a tent in the town commons so that ordinary people can come and tell them what they want the newspaper to cover. The fact is there are these changes that are beginning to take place, and not just in those cities, but in quite a number of others. Now, these examples speak to what we're talking about tonight, a form of democracy we call living democracy. It may be the only type of democracy rich enough to meet the problems of today's world, a living democracy. And it's living because we live it daily. I mean, in our lives in schools, like Kate, the, the student I quoted a little while ago, or in our workplaces, like, like Wharton Steele and the story that Francis just mentioned to you, or in our neighborhoods, like the courageous Teresa Francis or, or, um, or Naugatuck Valley and so on, living because people really are living it day after day, because it's alive, because it's dynamic, living because it's evolving, it's not some static state that we achieved some 200 years ago that we all learned about in school. Well, speaking of school-taught notions of democracy, we have to tell you a story, a true story that, that happened uh, very recently. A young friend of ours who had recently graduated from high school came to visit us, and it was during that period of what, what's called Rubbergate. Remember the bounced check by our congresspeople? And Keith came to visit that day, and he was extremely upset. I mean, Keith was livid. He walked into the living room and said, do you realize what's happening? We elected these people. We elected these people to represent us, and they can't even keep their balances straight. They keep balancing their checks. They don't even know how to keep a balance in their checkbook. What's going on here? Their checks keep bouncing. We said, yeah. He said, well, I just graduated from high school, and there I was taught that the very basis of our democracy is good checks and balances. <laughs> Absolutely true. true. <laughs> His outrage does not exactly capture what we mean by a living, evolving, dynamic democracy. So that's why we need to go deeper with you. And so what we want to do is try another one of our dialogues. And this time, I get to wear the tie, and my voice will represent living democracy. And Paul's will capture the prevailing notions about citizens' role in a democracy. So what we want to do very, very briefly is answer the question, each in a very different way. What is the appropriate role for citizens? What is public life in a democracy? Look, I know what public life is all about. It's about dog eat dog. It's about going after what's what what's mine. If I want if I want something from government, you know, a job, a license to build some houses, a stop sign or whatever it is, I know that I'm going to have to fight for it. Of course, my neighbors might want something very very different. So therefore, it's about figuring out my interest. It's about going after it. It's about fighting for it. It's about competing interests. I mean, it's got to be nasty. But Paul, I think if you wait just a minute and think a bit about what matters most to you, really, most to you, things like safe neighborhoods for your children to be able to walk to school, a clean environment to enjoy and to live longer within, fair opportunities for yourself and your children. If you think about the things that, that really mean most to us, each of us, I think we realize that we can't achieve them by ourselves, that we can only begin to approach them by seeing how our interests connect with other people's interests and moving from there. Yeah, but wait a minute. Negotiating interests, solving problems, I mean, you know, that's not what ordinary citizens should be expected to do. I mean, I'm a good citizen, okay? I pay my taxes in April. I vote in November, all right? I, you know, I try to elect the very best people I can think of to, to, to get into office, and then I step aside and I let them do their job. But you talk as if my public life is just my vertical tie to government, and it isn't. When I leave home every day as a worker, as a student, as a user of, of the media and the health and human services, in all of these ways, I am living my public life. The choices I make create the community in which I live and the larger environment. These are all arenas of my public life. Yeah, but you know what? The way you're talking about it sounds like there's no place for expertise. Where would these professors get their consulting money? I mean, we're talking about 
we're talking about a very complex world here. I mean, we've got to rely on professionals who know a lot more about the world than you do. I mean, it sounds like you want ordinary people to begin to make, you know, important decisions here. People who don't have the kind of knowledge that's really needed. And people who, you know, have your level of knowledge for crying out loud. Look, I I'm not anti-expertise. I want to make that very clear. But what's fuzzy and what we have to clarify is the appropriate role for citizens in decision making. The appropriate role is in defining values. Can I, can I give you just one example? I have a feeling I'm going to regret this, but all right, go ahead. Let me give you one example. Several years ago in Oregon, citizens decided that they had to come together to set the values within which the state's very limited budget for public health could, could be allocated. Very difficult decisions. Thousands of Oregonians met in hundreds of meetings, talking face to face, trying to decide on the common values that would guide the allocation of this limited amount of money for health care. They made tough choices. For example, they decided that it was more, more important than keeping a baby who was born without a brain alive for just a couple of weeks. More important was getting health care to tens of thousands of pregnant women. They made tough choices that ended up extending health care to many who did not have it. So they show that even in complex emotional issues, citizens have a role to play in setting the values and no. boundaries within which experts can offer their guidance. No, 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 no. The fact is that most people don't want a darn thing to do with public life. I mean, that's for activists. That's for people like you who have some strange way, some strange need to get their way in public for crying out loud, or people who think they know a lot more than the rest of us. See, I don't think that I'm that different. I really don't. I think that almost everyone wants to know that our voices count in the larger world, that we have a need, a deep need for meaning beyond our immediate families. In fact, psychologists tell us that the happiest people are those who have a purpose beyond their, their private lives. And what I began to see is that my public life, action in the world in which I can make a difference, is not just a means to an end to achieve what I want, but it's actually a means to develop who I am as a human being who you are as a human being, give me a break. You're making public life sound like some new age group therapy for crying out loud. You've been living in California too long. <laughs> in a deep human need, give me a break here. Right. Paul's voice is very strong in this, but by the end uh, of, the, of the talk, hopefully you, his voice will fade in your memory. Uh, now, let's look at what we've just said, because we've touched on a whole lot of questions concepts that we've just assumed in this country. For example, what's our true self-interest? And what is the appropriate role of the citizen? And what's the scope of public life? I mean, the real scope of public life, does it include workplaces and schools and so on, or is it really just the voting booth? And what is the role for citizens and what is the role for experts in this complex world? And how important is it that we all feel that our lives really count for something and that our voices are really heard in the public world? But we need to go deeper still. We need to learn very specific lessons which are emerging from those Americans who are successfully uh, engaging richly in public life and addressing real problems. We'll focus on four key lessons that are listed here on this outline for those of you who can see it. I'm sorry, it's not more visible. Four key lessons, and Paul will begin. All right, a first lesson is about relationship building relationships actually of mutual accountability. Living democracy is not about blame. I mean, whether we want to blame corporate greed on the one hand, or welfare frauds on the other, or media ownership co concentration, or school bureaucrats or whatever, just fill in the blank, right? And whoever we want to blame, okay, if we could just get rid of them, everything would be all right, right? Well, as our kids would say, not. The simple fact is that public life is about creating relationships of ongoing two-way accountability. And we'd like to tell you a little story about that to kind of illustrate what we're talking about. On a brisk fall evening last year, we entered an auditorium in Sebastopol, which is a small town just north of San Francisco. And the air was electric. And it was very, very serious at the same time. And among us stood Hispanic farm workers, 
They were looking exhausted, but they were also eager. And alongside were Quakers and Presbyterians and, and Episcopalians from white middle-class, middle-aged churches. And there were also representatives of an African-American church. And all of them were members of the Sonoma County Faith-Based Organizing Project. And they were there to evaluate candidates for the school board. And it was a fabulous scene. Because what they did was, just, just as you are gathered here, they had five candidates, all five candidates, who knew if they were going to be elected, they better get these people's votes, up there on the stage. And then the usual scene that you see with, you know, when people are talking to candidates or candidates are talking to people didn't happen at all. What they did was they divided into five groups around the auditorium. And each candidate had to go with one of the groups. And then the rules were that the candidate couldn't utter a single syllable. Everybody in the small group got to tell the candidate what was on his or her mind. And then the candidates had to reassemble up here on the stage. And then they had to tell the assembled audience what they had just heard. And there was a big report card, and they were graded on how well they had listened. And they got grades on listening. That's what we mean. That's what we mean by mutual accountability. The folks that we observed that night were not asking city officials to simply fix a problem. They were entering into a relationship with a mutual accountability. And what they decided to do was to have those candidates pledge, if elected, to meet with these people regularly over time. Because how can we build relationships of mutual accountability if we believe that all the power is in somebody else's hands, the CEO or uh, the, the boss, the, the, the professor, wh whoever it is in, in authority. Okay, now it's your turn again. We're going to ask you a question. What's the first word that comes to mind when I say the word power? What do you think of? Anybody? Control. Okay, control. That's a very common answer. Yeah. What else? Power. What comes to mind? Men. Men. Okay. All right. She actually meant to say white men. Okay. All right. Go ahead. Abuse. Abuse. Okay. Good. Good. What else? Yeah. Coercion. Coercion. Well, I'm glad you're doing that. Can I, I don't think I can spell coercion. Anyway. Okay. Yes. How about back here? Corruption. Corruption. Whoa. All right. Yes. Manipulation. Manipulation. You got that. Can you can you write fast oh, enough? Yeah. Okay. Two more. Money, money. Love. Pardon me? Love. Love? Yes. Why do you say that? That's true power. Ah, did you all hear that? Love because that's true power, okay? Well, let me tell you that when one teacher asks some 10th graders that question, what comes to mind when you hear the word power? Guess what they say? They said money, in this order, money, control, parents, Adolf Hitler, <laughs> weapons, and bullies. Now we have a teenager who would link money and control and parents all And together. Adolf Hitler probably. And that's probably Adolf Hitler too. <laughs> and so if we think of power as control over others and as a fixed commodity, the more for you, the less for me, or vice versa, then we're likely to think of power as bad. I mean, after all, if I don't have it, I want it. And if you've got it, I don't like that. But I better fight like hell to keep it, too. So in that sense, we think of power as bad. But wait a minute, Paul. <laughs> we all need power to realize our values, to realize our legitimate interests. So the second lesson of living democracy is that power is not a dirty word. We have a lot of associations that are very negative. But power is not an either-or, as it is in some of these, these uh, associations. It's not an either-or, either you have it or I, and you have it and I don't. In fact, we're learning by observing that power always exists in a relationship. Think about that for a second. It means that what I do affects you. I mean, even if it's just trying to resist any effect. Power exists in a relationship. So if that is true, it means that no one is ever utterly without power. Now on the top half of your third handout, handout number three, we capture some of the contrasts 
between these negative views of power and an enabling view of power. Now, what happens? When we let go of the fear of power, we begin to discover some unappreciated sources that may be open to us. And we begin to return power to its original meaning in Latin, posse, to be able. Now, if you look at, if you look at handout number four on the back of that page, we've listed there some underappreciated sources of power. For example, the power of knowledge. ACORN is a national organization with 70,000 members, and nearly all of them are low income. But when ACORN members took on the banking industry, and here's a national example, by the way, they took on the banking industry for neglecting poor communities and not, lo not lending for housing in poor communities, something we all know about, right? And they knew, however, in ACORN that they had a lot of learning to do. They had to develop the power of knowledge. Bank regulation is a very, very complex topic. But after enough study and discussion and eventually lobbying, they succeeded in passing national legislation that has returned $8 billion into poor neighborhoods throughout this country. And one college professor told us that those poor people learn more about banking regulation than most professors of finance. And last summer, when ACORN called a meeting on low-income housing, guess what? 40 banks sent representatives. That's power. The power of knowledge. But citizens are also discovering the power of humor. Kentuckians for the Commonwealth is an organization of thousands of people in that state, Kentucky, of all walks of life. You may know that they've had to confront toxic dumping in that state, and for decades, the coal company has had tremendous power. Now, Kentuckians for the Commonwealth decided that they would make a point by putting a bed in the state capitol. And in that bed, they had their farmer president of KFTC and other members tucked into bed with their stocking caps on. And under the covers, they passed huge wads of fake cash. Now, some of those, uh, the, the one person in bed was representing the coal company, the others representing the legislators. Now, the media couldn't miss the message <laughs> that, in fact, the coal companies controlled the legislators' vote. And that went out over the airwaves. Ultimately, Kentuckians for the Commonwealth, even despite the tremendous power of the coal companies in that state, Kentuckians for the Commonwealth succeeded in passing a constitutional amendment to that state, which protected farmland from strip mining. Mm -hmm. Now, the third lesson of living democracy has to do with self-interest. And again, I want to ask you, as soon as I say self-interest, what comes to mind? What are the usual things that come to mind when you say self-interest? Anybody? Okay, ego. Okay, ego. And then somebody back here? Selfish? Greed. The, okay, greed. Yeah, that's very common. Anybody else? Strength, self-interest and strength. Okay, what else? Anyone else? Work. Why work? That's interesting. That's how you accomplish. That's how you so you're working for it. Okay. All right. Great. When he thinks of his self-interest, he thinks about all the work he's got to do. All right. Great. Great. Okay. You know, it's kind of funny, isn't it? Our culture really carries two messages about self-interest. First. We're told that public life is really about getting what's ours and standing up for our rights and whatever, or in some cases, being men, right? <laughs> On the other hand, we're told that we should squelch our self-interest or act like Mother Teresa or act on behalf of those who are less fortunate or act on behalf of the common good. But suppose that we really think of self-interest as what we legitimately bring to public life. It's what we care most about, after all. I mean, what are our interests? Um, our careers, our families, our faith, all the things that matter most to us, those are the interests that we legitimately bring to public life. So it just doesn't work to preach to people to let go of their interests. What we're learning is that what does work is to show people that in order to pursue your self-interest, you have to see how it connects to other people's self-interest. And on the bottom of handout three, we've been compared 
these two very different notions of self-interest, self-interest is selfishness, or what we call relational self-interest because it's based on our connectedness with one another. Now, Monty Brule is a young African-American construction contractor in, in uh, Chattanooga, Tennessee, and he taught us this third lesson of relational self-interest here. He is also the president of Chattanooga Venture, which is this fabulous organization that has managed to pull the city together to plan a brand new future, and over the last 11 years, to at least partially achieve the future that those people want. And he taught us this relational thinking about self-interest. And he said to us, and this is a direct quote, and I want to read this, he said, people now know that they can't make enough money to get away from the polluted environment, no matter how wealthy they are. Or even crime, that's affecting the wealthy neighborhoods too. In other words, he said, there may be no purely selfish solutions left anymore. All the solutions, the real solutions, involve us with other people. To act in our selfish interest in today's world is to get people to act together. Well, what does this look like in practice? Let me give you a short example from San Antonio. Now, a few years back, San Antonio, people in San Antonio were extremely angry because corporations were importing people from out of state to fill jobs. But there was very high unemployment, especially among Hispanics in San Antonio. Now, the organization that I'm going to tell you about, Communities Organized for Public Service, COPS, might have just staged an angry protest, even claiming racism. But what did they do instead? Instead, they sat down at the same table with leaders in each of the corporations around the city, and they listened. They listened to the concerns of corporations that were unable to find qualified people locally. And out of that process and tremendous research they did, including looking at uh, job training programs in Europe, these citizens divide, discovered that the essential problem had to do with lack of training opportunities. And they composed a complete reshaping of job training for the city of San Antonio. It was passed unanimously by the city council and has now become a national model. So what we're seeing here is that the lesson is that citizens began by probing the self-interest of their supposed adversaries and ended up meeting their own self-interest as well. Selfishness and self-interest are not the same thing. So now we're moving from the subject of self-interest really to this last major art, if you will, and that has to do with capacity building, the set of arts. Effective problem solving involves relationship building, which we talked about. It involves redefining power and understanding it much more fully. It involves relational self-interest. It involves rethinking all of that, but those kinds of lessons are not at all easy to live. After all, we weren't born effective citizens. We weren't born effective collaborators. But we're convinced, again by our observation, that we can all learn these arts of democracy with all the deliberateness and the pleasure that we get from learning to read or write or play basketball or whatever. In fact, one member of the group that I just mentioned in San Antonio talked about the quality of her organization. She said, it's a university in public life. The human development here is incredible. Now, the most effective classrooms, the most effective organizations all across the country are really those that are emphasizing training participants in these arts of democracy. Elementary school children defining the rules by which they're going to interact. And workplaces training teams to collaborate and to cooperate in problem solving. And organizations such as Kentuckians for the Commonwealth rehearsing every public action over and over again so their members grow in skill and confidence. Now what are these arts of democracy? We've listed just a few of them on your last handout, number five. They include mediation and negotiation and evaluation, ongoing evaluation, and certainly reflection. But maybe the most difficult for us in this culture, maybe the most difficult art of democracy that makes problem solving work is the art of creative conflict. Now, what is it that makes conflict creative rather than destructive? Well, what has to do with, we, and again, by talking to people all across the country, what we've learned is that there has to be conscious attention to creating an environment in which people feel safe to dissent, safe to differ, because we're all afraid of ridicule, of exposure, of being labeled. 
And we're convinced that it's possible to make an environment safe for difference, for creative conflict, even on the most emotionally charged public issues. Would you believe abortion? We talked to people in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, for example. Those in favor of protecting access to abortion, abortion reached out to those who are opposed, and they made their meetings safe. How did they do it? They arrived at seven rules, but maybe most important, they disallowed the use of any cliche, any label, or any rhetoric so that the participants didn't have to defend themselves against those, and they were able then to listen and to discover an incredible common ground of concern about women with unwanted pregnancies. And out of this, they were able actually jointly to build a suggested sexual education model that they then offered to the state legislature. Now in St. Louis, the two sides of the abortion debate reached out to one another and they took a very different tack. When they came together, they agreed, again, to make the environment safe. They agreed to talk about everything but abortion. And they too began to discover that they had common ground that would allow them to collaborate. Some people think that, in fact, the way we sometimes argue with the tie and all of that in these mock dialogues up on stage is a, is a good example of conflict. <laughs> well, we, we, when people have ever said this to us, we, we have a great retort. And that is that we learned a long time ago that, that uh, marriage is really nature's way of keeping people from fighting with strangers. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, the story though, that Francis just told you about the abortion antagonist really reminds us that perhaps the first art of democracy has to do with listening. We're all pretty good at talking. Not too many of us are very good at listening. In private life, though, we're, we're often amazed that when we have a problem and we go to someone else and he or she just listens, that suddenly we discover that it's we ourselves who had the answer all along and that all that we needed was a chance to kind of formulate that answer and, and, and communicate it. Well, that same possibility exists in public life. In North Carolina, there's a project called the Listening Project. And there, they do hundreds of in-depth, one-on-one interviews, door-to-door, -door, with individual people in their homes. And they don't do this quick check-offs kind of survey to get people's views and then move on to another home. In, in one home, a white man complained that the biggest problem on his block were these noisy black teenagers at the end of the block who were making all, these, all the noise and was hanging, were hanging out on the streets and caused trouble. Now, on, that simple, on a simple survey, that one comment might have gotten him labeled a racist, but instead, <coughs> excuse me, instead, these people simply listened and they allowed him to talk, and they asked a few probing questions, and he went deeper and deeper. And by the end of the evening, he had redefined the entire problem. And the problem that he saw it then in his neighborhood was the lack of decent recreational opportunities and decent job opportunities for these kids. So when we think of listening as passive, the stories that we've been hearing about democracy in action actually suggest something, very, something much more, that the very act of being listened to actually changes the speaker's own understanding. Now, of course, there are many, many other arts of democracy that we need to develop in order to effectively address our problems. So, what is it that distinguishes today's surge of citizen engagement? Is it body protest? Is it localized? Is it simply transient? Well, before jumping to any of these conclusions, consider. The changes in living toward living democracy, the changes that are embodied in the examples that we gave tonight, touch every sector of our society. There's much more involved than simply protesting failed policies. In fact, citizens are changing the way that decisions get made. They're creating ongoing roles for citizens in public decision making. That means that they are changing the core assumptions of our society about what ordinary people are capable of and what we are interested in being part of. So it's an extraordinary time. It's a time of, of apparent collapse and disintegration in many ways, and yet we hope you see also of opportunity, unprecedented opportunity. Now, what does it take to take advantage of being born into, to, to be the privilege of living in this era? First, I would suggest that 
instead of simply decrying our powerlessness, that we begin to open our eyes to the sources of power, maybe those listed on that handout of ours, the sources of power open to any of us in our public lives, on this campus, in our communities, in the larger United States. Remember that we all live within a web of relationships in which we do have influence. Second, we willingly risk. And what do we risk? Well, first, let me make a case that I don't think that we can believe our society can move forward, that it can't change, unless we experience ourselves changing. And the only way to do that is through risk. We must risk, well, we all have to figure out ourselves what we have to risk, and in that way, maybe that's the riskiest part. But we certainly have to risk believing in that which we will ultimately never see the results of. And that may be extremely difficult when we are part of a historical transformation in the very meaning of democracy. Now, I say this is a risk because I remember once when in the Institute, my, the Food First Institute of 10 years ago, uh, a, a young volunteer came in and as he was leaving a few months later, he came to me and said, Francis, he said, I considered going into your line of work trying to change the world. But he said, I thought better of it. He said, the problem is you can go for weeks and not see any change at all. <laughs> and I couldn't argue with him. <laughs> but I do take comfort in this aspect of the risk that we're all called upon in such a time. I take comfort in the words of one of my heroes from the 1970s, and that is I have stone. When he was confronted early in the 1970s, no one was listening to him about the U.S. role in Vietnam. And they said, Mr. Stone, what keeps you going? No one is listening to your point of view. And he said quite simply, if you expect to see the final results of your work, you have simply not asked a big enough question. Now, Francis and I moved to these conclusions by really studying the stories of success across this country. And earlier I told you how I had looked at human service agencies and community organizing and college teaching and the human potential movement and so on. And slowly along the way I discovered, as she did too, that what, what was really underneath it all was that our democracy itself wasn't working to solve the huge persistent problems of poverty and racism and environmental degradation and so on that have so affected our lives. But also along the way, I want to tell you that I really became proud because there are Americans who are working effectively to solve the problems of this country, and I think we ought to honor them. There are Americans in every town, in every city, in every valley in this land who insist that I am a free human being and I will have my voice heard. And there are Americans who are insisting that we will learn somehow a lesson that we perhaps have forgotten. We will learn to work together to solve our problems. And their message is that in every classroom, in every factory, in every home, in every synagogue, in every church, and on every campus, in every town hall, in every service agency, in fact, we can ask two simple words as we go through our day. Why not? Why not come together, for example? Why not build the relationships that address the deepest issues that so concern us? Why not talk about our problems, actually begin to talk meaningfully and creatively about our problems? Why not share our values and apply them to our highest issues? We don't see this happening in this country anymore. Why not? Why not discover all of the types of power that are open to us? Why not learn to define self-interest relationally? Why not hold our so-called public servants accountable? Why not insist that our values become their agenda? We're very proud, the two of us, that there are Americans who are learning the skills to do just that. There are thousands of successful Americans across this country who are asking, why does our democracy have to wallow in the cynicism and the despair that we see in the media. Why not make it our effective practice for solving our problems? And we're very proud also and grateful that you've asked us here tonight really to talk with you, and I hope we can talk together both, to, both for the next few minutes here as we take some questions and also to, in tomorrow's session. We're proud of that, we're grateful, because ultimately, the hope lies in each of us and all of us together. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Are there questions?
Yeah. Hey, there's one. Uh, assuming that we buy into a living democracy as, as one of the, the keys towards revitalizing our democracy. Okay, let, let me interrupt you slightly just to okay. tell. He began with a wonderful assumption. He said, assuming that we buy into living democracy as one of the keys, okay. Okay, uh, then I have a two-part question. How would you recommend that we operationalize the philosophy into America other than just hoping that it spontaneously happens? And the second part of the question is, how do we uh, recruit the media uh, into that campaign of operationalizing the Okay, the two questions are how do we operationalize, he's a social scientist, how do, we, <laughs> how do we operationalize these kinds of lessons so we're not just simply hoping that they take hold, and how do we take these lessons really into the media, essentially, and make them operate essentially democratically? You want to start? Well, I think that the, the gist of what we're getting across tonight is that each of us in our own, in our own realm would have to see what openings exist. And what we hope our book will do, as opposed to just a one-hour talk, doing democracy gives such an array, our book will give such an array of examples that it will spur people's sense of how can I operationalize this, what, depending on what my most important concern is. And so the hows have to come, become very personal at that point. There can't be a general formula. Um, but there are some specific lessons, and that's what we hope we've drawn out. So I don't know if we can answer that by saying one, two, three, other than sort of the content of our whole talk in terms of the orientation to open your eyes to what possibilities are there on this campus, in this community. Now, vis-a-vis -vis the media, uh, Paul mentioned the Philadelphia Inquirer and the Wichita Eagle as examples of, of media, uh, confronting media and saying, where is your self-interest? Your self-interest, newspapers are less and less read. Uh, newspapers have to reconnect with the concerns of their community. And how do you bring that to the editorial uh, staff and others on the newspaper here in this community? Uh, that their viability depends on addressing the real pressing concerns uh, of this, of this and, and any other community in which a newspaper is trying to be viable. That's just one example. In our, we can also say that, in our, uh, that our organization, the Institute for the Arts of Democracy, distributes uh, resource list that could give you examples of organizations that are working on the media for as, as one as one sector organizations that are working uh, to make the media more accountable working to promote a uh, more of the sort of Wichita Eagle kind of example the Philadelphia Inquirer example media literacy organizations that are helping parents particularly understand how to monitor the media coming into their homes and to educate children to be critical of what they see so those uh, resource guides are available to any of you who want to go deeper uh, into some of these themes that we talked about tonight. I think the first step for almost everyone is that people have to believe. And at this point, they don't believe. As, as we said in one of the dialogues, in fact, people are not really apathetic. If you, if you look deeply enough, they really care, but they feel shut out. So they have to believe. How do they get to believe? Well, that's part of what we're trying to do. They learn the stories of success. And as those stories begin to spread, in fact, they become inspired to find their own ways. These aren't, this isn't our doctrine. In fact, the last chapter of the book is entitled, What? No Manifesto? I mean, these aren't our stories. These are their stories and their lessons. So first they have to believe. Then they have to learn the skills together that allow them to become actively engaged. And one of the things that we didn't spend much time on is the fact that when they become engaged, they find that it's really fun and it changes their lives for the better time after time after time. We, we've learned an expression with many, many independent sort of people coming into public life role for the first time in a very conscious way. So they've discovered the fun of power. <laughs> the fun of power is a phrase we've heard many, many times now. I guess we have time for one more question. Do we have one? Or should we just wait until tomorrow at, at the lunch? Why don't we do that, all right? Um, what is it, at 12 o'clock tomorrow? At noon tomorrow. Where, where is it? Is a little different than 12 now. Okay. Okay. Pine Room. At Pioneer. Pioneer, Pioneer, Pioneer Room, Room at noon. We okay. welcome all of at you there. And and we'd love to have a, have a real conversation about all of this so that we can all go deeper. We can answer questions and ask you questions. Okay. Thank you very, very much. Thank you.